breaking down the wide receiver position, all the tiers and targets. That's what we're going to be talking about today on Stealing Paninas. I'm Ben Gretsch. You can find Stealing Signals at bengretsch.substack.com. A lot of articles there in the last couple of weeks. And with me, as always, is Sean Siegel. You can find all of his great work over at Rotoviz. A lot of articles there in the last couple of weeks. And Sean, we're getting down to crunch time. We are into the final weeks before the season. We were recording this on Monday, August 21st. The Thursday night opener is two weeks and three days away. That is crazy to think about. I still have a ton of stuff that I want to write and do before the season starts. Um, We are right on the precipice of all of it. And you mentioned to me we've been doing – we, we, we it's funny wide receiver is such a important position to everything that we do and talk about here, but we tend to spend a lot more time talking about other positions. Sometimes you mentioned, we've talked a lot about the running backs uh, over the last couple of weeks and maybe hadn't really taken this time to talk through the receiver position and the ways that we're playing the position that is so talent driven is a key part of our draft strategies because the players that go high are typically the ones that have the elite ceilings. And so you're building in both that ceiling, but also floor with those picks. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we've talked about in the last few years that the market has caught up to is that the wide receiver picks are the safe picks as opposed to the running back picks 10, 20 years ago, it was always running backs are the safe picks. That's what you're getting your guaranteed touches. You got to go get those guaranteed workloads. But the reality is that's not the way that it's played out. ADP-wise, over the last several years, decades, where running backs, the ones that are very successful, not always the ones that are drafted at the top. And there's not a lot of clear correlation there. Obviously, guys from the later rounds can end up being uh, big-time stars. Josh Jacobs was the best example last year of a guy who was going a lot later and ended up in the top few. At that position, you just don't see quite as much of that at receiver. And certainly, I guess, in the Josh Jacobs range, from last year, round eight, round nine, round six, wherever he was going. There's been receivers in those ranges that have finished near the top. But at running back, there's also the double-digit types that come all the way up. You don't see that at receiver. And so receiver is this foundational position. We know that that the talent level matters so much to the scoring, and that's why we like to target them basically all the time, whenever we can be targeting them. We do. And that was the case again in our main event last week, Ben, I had the great pleasure of drafting with the three of you on ship chasing. We were able to land six wide receivers in those first nine rounds, even though I had pitched a barely running back heavy plan going in, but we were lucky enough in that draft to have T Higgins last to us at the 306. And I think for both of us, he is the end of that first real elite tier. And that's caused an issue for drafters who have the 101, 102 this year, where often he will not make it back to the drafters who got to select Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase. So you have these interesting mix of incentives in 2023. One of the things that I've talked a lot about in recent articles, and I mentioned the Apex Experts draft, where I drafted five running backs in the first seven rounds, because we've gotten so wide receiver heavy this year that you actually are losing points in many cases if you go wide receiver. And Ben, that's never been the case. The argument in the past has always been the market is requiring that we draft these running backs simply to keep pace with other people who are drafting running backs. And now we're into this weird environment with wide receivers where people are saying you've got to draft wide receivers to keep pace with the other people who are drafting wide receivers. And while there's always a kernel of truth to that, both before with the running back position and now with the wide receiver position, one of the big talking points for this year has simply been how do you manage and avoid getting sort of old under by the wide receiver avalanche. There are also some other elements at play, which is one of the reasons that I think having good wide receiver rankings and really understanding your tiers is so important this year because you can't just go out and take whoever the top wide receiver is or you know eyes closed select the top receiver on the board through six rounds and feel like you've accomplished your objectives we talked so many times about how do we go out there in a draft 
and select six of the top 15 wide receivers in terms of year end rankings. And some of that is that you've got to be wide receiver heavy. Some of that is looking forward to the end of the year, kind of doing that exercise that you and I had so much fun with last week, where we project the first round and second round of 2024 drafts. But, you know, mixed in with that is this idea that you actually do have to be aware of which receivers you're taking. You can't take them blindly. And that's more the case now than it has ever been. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Before we get too far into it, Ben, I also want to mention just some of the fun things that are going on. You had your first stream for Stealing Signals Gold subscribers last week. That went really well. I kind of wanted to sign up and just you know lurk in the background because I enjoy listening to you discuss with folks like how fantasy works and what they should be doing for their specific leagues and drafts. I had a draft with Colin Kelly for OT going at the same time, so that didn't really work out. But I just think this is such a great product you're doing and both in terms of having fun with it, getting signups, all those kinds of things, the early reviews have been fantastic. Yeah, that's been a lot of fun. That's something that I'll be doing over at Signals uh, weekly throughout the season after Stealing Signals goes up on Tuesday nights doing some live streams where basically I'm the only person on the live stream, but answering the, the questions in the chat on, you know, it's not going to be something that you can find on the internet. They're going to be unlisted videos just for the, the Signals Gold subscribers. It was really fun to do that the first time. I appreciate you uh, bringing that up. And we'll be doing a lot more of those as the season uh, goes on, especially at least one more here in the preseason as well. But yeah, those are a lot of fun, Sean. But yeah, the the, the wide receiver position. One one of the questions I got in in that first ceiling uh, that signals gold live stream was about my ranking of Amon Ross St. Brown and Garrett Wilson because I have them aggressively ranked ahead of Stephon Diggs, AJ Brown, and CD Lamb, and it was specifically contrasting those two young players versus those three more stable players that have had the, the higher ADP. And I think that's a really interesting sort of launching point for what you were just saying about the wide receivers that you, you can't just blindly take any wide receivers. And some of this is a youth versus veteran discussion, but only because of the way the market plays it. Because over the years we've had, a lot of certainty from the market about the players that we've already seen it from, as opposed to those that you have to project forward a little bit. And I have a piece that I'm going to write eventually that's stealing signals. That's just another way of writing something that Sean, we've talked about a lot about um, rookies being such an important part of the redraft equation and breakout players being such an important part of it. And just trying to th think through that from another sort of philosophical way and, and, and talk through it. Uh, the, the working title I have for it is get comfortable assuming rookies will be stars. And that's something that I'm going to kind of talk through. I mean, yes, they do bust as well, but uh, so do veterans. I, I, you know, I, I saw a tweet recently that kind of tilted me a little bit because I, I, I referenced this type of thinking a lot. And a lot of the stuff that I've talked about with this over the years where because we've seen it, we don't seem to take misses with veterans as personally as misses with rookies. So when you're drafting a player, and uh, uh, Ezekiel Elliott last year is the one that comes to my mind. He's a running back. He's not even a receiver. He had fallen off some. Everyone knew the risks going in, but they also were telling themselves the upside was still there with Zeke because they had seen this upside in the past. Even though people like us on our show, Sean, were saying the upside's probably not still there. We've actually seen the started to see the decline, and these types of decline trends at running back don't get reversed. It would be very exceptional to the rule at running back but people have seen that production in the past with Ezekiel Elliott. So they're saying he has this type of ceiling, even though he, I would argue, never did for 2022. I don't think you could have made the case that he ever could have just turned back the clock to the player he was in the early years of his career. But because people had seen that, they thought they were trying to get something that no longer existed in his current year profile. And then when he falls off as well, yeah, you already kind of acknowledge that there was some age-related decline and it doesn't feel as personal to have missed on that because you were chasing something that you had seen before. You knew what Ezekiel Elliott at his peak looked like from a scoring potential. You don't know that with young players. And so when you take a swing on a Sky Moore last year and he doesn't pan out, it feels very personal. 
There was a misevaluation of what Sky Moore actually is. It was wrong. You don't know ball, Sean, right? <laughs> you don't know how to watch the, the film and understand that the Sky Moore just didn't actually have it, even though in a lot of ways he did look like a lot of players that do have it. And there are misses, right? And there are misses in a variety of ways. Cort- Corlin Sutton is a veteran that was going much higher last year. Uh, I'm looking at my ranks this year and, and see those guys ranked very closely. And um, Sutton was a guy going much higher last year who who failed. And, you know, you think about people in that range of Sky Moore who failed and then don't get punished in the same way. People are evidently, I mean, I wouldn't say very comfortable. If they were very comfortable with the wide receiver avalanches, they'd be going earlier. But people are willing to, you know, make the same bet on Michael Thomas that they made last year, even though making that bet has consistently been very damaging to your roster, you know, ever since he was a superstar. Larry Andrews had a great article on this several years ago now before we even got a number of these additional massive receiver seasons where he was talking about rookies. And this was from a best ball lens. But in this particular instance, you're going to get very similar dynamics when you think through what's going to benefit you or help you in redraft. But rookies are dangerous and they do have some pretty high bust rates. But we tend to think about it even in the wrong area of draft and with the wrong types of players, because in the top 100 picks, they're actually less risky than they are later. And so you think through that and you think through redraft specifically, which is what you and I are discussing on this show. And that's perfect for you, because when you spend those you know, high value selections on a receiver, whether it's JSN, uh, Quinton Johnston, Zay Flowers, you know, some of the other guys like that, or whether you're taking some risk later in redraft, when those rookies bust, it's not a huge problem for you. If you've gotten them outside the first 10 rounds, because you have waivers and you can continue to shuttle people around. And if the pick doesn't work, but maybe it's going to play out later, you can move the guy to waivers, go back and get him. But when we think about these guys early on, and one of the things that you know I always like to talk about in terms of being willing to take a ton of risks but also taking a zero bad players philosophy. And that's something where, you know, I'll occasionally get into mild disagreements with drafters who otherwise see things very similarly to the way that I do, but you'll get there and you're talking about a rookie and, you know, I'll be in and they won't or vice versa. And the thing for me is if the player was not good in college, then I'm not that interested in his camp reports from the, you know, just a very small, sample that also is not actual games whether those college games or nfl games right you get small sample stuff from non-actual football games and move guys up who are not good that's where it doesn't interest me but these guys who were stars in college just take that right again as you said they're going to be a wider range of outcomes and we do see some of these guys miss but when you've watched a guy already do it then the way that that translates to the NFL is actually very direct and the production element is absolutely huge. And we talk about what types of profiles tend to beat draft position and what type of profiles tend to, you know, follow behind it or lag where they go. And it's that age and experience related production trajectory. So again, when you're thinking through that, like who has proven it and who hasn't, you don't necessarily need to take the risks on guys who either were old when they actually produced against college players, because most of your NFL stars didn't need that. Right. I mean, they were very good right away against college players or guys who never did it. I'm very comfortable fading those players. And when I miss, and you're going to miss every once in a while being okay with that. But we're talking about these guys who were very, very good as young players in college. The concern in almost all cases is overstated especially if, again, the context or the contrast sets you up to where the veteran pick also doesn't actually help you. And Ben, I think we've got a couple of levels of that that we're going to want to get into here. You mentioned at the very top where players like Stephon Diggs and Devontae Adams and even someone like A.J. Brown, where I think it's different. I mean, with Stephon Diggs and Devontae Adams, we actually have some concerns about how well they'll play this year. Not that they're not going to be very good, But are you going to be good enough to keep up with the next step that an Amon Ra or a Garrett Wilson or even, I think, a Chris Olave takes? Even though 
I can still obviously see taking the veterans over him in his situation. AJ Brown, you have a volume issue. And I think that some listeners are going to say, well, you guys have consistently ignored that all the way through. Why would this be an issue for you now? And for me, it's not so much a matter of what the projections are going to say as it is. You've got to work through the scenarios for yourself and you've got to price the different ones and then look at what those prices mean for you when you're drafting. If you're paying for AJ Brown above what he can realistically do from a scenario based perspective, unless he hits, you know, up there 85th, 90th percentile, then you're drafting him in a range where that talent and the upside is priced in. That's a big issue for him this year for from a variety of perspectives because you have both pass volume and you have target competition there are some other guys who have maybe are not the same talent bets because basically no one except for maybe a justin jefferson maybe a hill maybe a cup you know hopefully a jamar chase are going to be similar talent bets but you have players who are elite talents in their own right who just have so many other ways that they can do it so that i mean that does make it a little bit uncomfortable, especially when I probably don't have quite the same gap in talent between Brown and Devonte Smith as you do. You can get Smith at the two, three turn, but even then Smith there is tricky. When you compare him to a T Higgins, you compare him to a Chris Olave. You know, sometimes those guys are right together. Sometimes they are not, but that range once cup is gone to once Higgins is gone. Interesting because of those contrasts, and we think about league winners, for me, it seems like the young guys give you a little bit more potential. You hit on a ton of great notes there. Um, a couple of times I thought I should stop talking and then I just... No, uh, it was it was awesome. The, the I mean, when you were talking through the rookies, the, the point I was saying about having this article that I want to write that I'm loosely referring to is like, get comfortable assuming that rookies will be stars. You pretty much wrote that article for me. So that was fantastic, especially talking through the ones that really have the profiles, right? That are the top hundred picks and redraft guys that we have a reason to really trust. Cause the idea is not that every single rookie is going to be a superstar. Obviously there are some that are not going to be, but it really is the ones like the JSNs this year that people still are like, I just haven't seen it yet. And it's like, there's no reason for you to think anything other than he's as good as where he's being drafted in fantasy draft, probably better. He's probably being held back. Uh, because we haven't seen it yet, right? But like his actual profile, what he did in college at the level he played at and with the competition he played at, and now what he's done with camp reports and in the preseason, this guy's just going to be very good. You're going to see this in a few weeks. Once you see him on the field in the NFL season, the regular season, everyone's going to go, yeah, I mean, should have known, <laughs> right? Like we did the same thing with Jamar Chase. You have, to, you have to get comfortable with that in advance. And I think, Sean, you talked through that incredibly well. It truly, it's not every single rookie, but it is the ones that, it, 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 I mean, look, I said it's hard to sort of articulate the point, but the ones that, uh, the only way I know how to say it is the ones that I, I know that I want to take swings on. <laughs> and those are the, like, he's one of the ones that I know that I want to take a lot of swings on and, and just be comfortable assuming that he's going to be incredibly good. The same way that we assume any veteran can maintain what they've been able to do up to a point. As you were talking through the veterans as well, um, it's probably no surprise on AJ Brown that I've started to actually come around on him. I completely agree with your point that I don't think he can really be a home run at his cost. The way I've been thinking through it is he is feels like a triple, right? Four straight years of yards per out run of 2.5 or better, which are all incredibly high numbers. The types of numbers that the other guys going around him don't necessarily post every single year like he does. He's just so good. The floor is incredibly high. Diggs, for example, was 249 last year, just under the 2.5 threshold, has a couple of seasons over 2.5 in his career, but not, you know, every season of his career type guy wasn't even at two in 2021. CeeDee Lamb has not hot, hit 2.5 yet in his career. So a little bit different in terms of like the actual skill level for a guy like AJ Brown. And so, yeah, when you were talking about the difference between Brown and Devonta Smith for me, I mean, I, I don't think Smith is markedly worse either, but um I do think Brown is just really, really, really good. Obviously, I think the the listeners know that I that I that I seem to believe that about AJ Brown. But it is interesting. And when I got asked that question about Diggs and Brown and Lamb as it relates to Amon Ra and Wilson, I mean, particularly for Amon Ra, one of my main points was 
um, that we've already seen it from a per route basis. He missed some time in multiple games last year. He left one game with a concussion. He left another with a knee injury. The game he came back, he didn't play a full slate of snaps. So his per game numbers, maybe not elite elite, but you look at his targets per out run profile right on, on par with Cooper Cup in a, in a variety of ways. He talked through this lower A dot guy, but adding yak, really strong targets per out run and strong yards per target for a guy at a lower A dot especially in PPR. I mean, the profile is fantastic. It's already there. And we don't even necessarily know how high he can go, how high he can fly, what his ceiling is going to be. But it's already there in terms of looking uh, competitive with like Diggs and Lamb and those guys. And so people that feel more confident in them over Amon Ra and feel like Amon Ra is projecting some type of breakout, I would argue have missed what the numbers are already telling us on a guy like Amon Ra. Wilson, I get it because, you know, the quarterback issues last year, he didn't really have a real massive point scoring breakout that it is projecting another step forward that we haven't seen from the digs, lamb, et cetera. But one of the other phrases we use sometimes, Sean, is this idea of don't pay for past production. And you talk through this as well, where we've seen some of this stuff with the older guys, but like a digs and you were talking about like, well, there might be some concerns about their way of, of, of being able to score this coming year. What we know about Stefan Diggs, who we love here, is that he has the capability in a good situation and an offense that is producing in a certain way to score at a really high level, at a certain level. We've seen that, that, that elite ceiling type season. We know it's possible for him. But as he's aging, there's a little bit of concern there. Not a ton. He's not super old or anything. But also there's an element where going into any season, you do need to understand what the player is capable of, and then also what his surroundings are. And then the, the key thing you brought up, what the price is. What are we getting in terms of price to make this type of a bet? A player that is very similar, and I actually have ranked quite a bit lower, but I do think is very similar, is Keenan Allen, who's a little bit older, but had a really good bounce back year and in terms of a per route uh, role last year. And I do still think has enough in the tank based on what he showed last year to be a good producer. Then you say in the right situation and at the right cost and those things. And for Keenan, he's going at a point well after that T Higgins, you know, early elite receiver window closes. Well, not well after he's often the very next receiver taken, but point being, you don't have the opportunity cost of potentially a Garrett Wilson when you take Keenan Allen, where you do uh, when you take digs, but Allen is also set up in an offense this year that when we just look at 2023, it looks like one that we want to have a lot of exposure to and pieces of. And it doesn't mean we don't want to have exposure in pieces of the Bills offense. But the Chargers, frankly, are one that I'm more excited about. I do think the Bills, we've talked about this on the show a little, Sean, are going to do a little bit more that now they brought in Dalton Kincaid, a little bit more out of the two tight end sets. And probably when defenses don't get out of their light packages are going to then run out of those two tight end sets. Not a ton. They're still going to be a, you know, a positive pass rate over expected team and those things. But the Bills also, just from the one of the things I talked through on the show the other night, from a multi-year perspective, they've now had a couple really good regular seasons where they've stalled out in the playoffs. And one of the things we saw with the Chiefs the last couple of years was a willingness to hold things back for the postseason. They showed that in the Super Bowl with that motion return play that they called twice for easy touchdowns in the second half. And I, I can't remember exactly what it was. Was it Andy Reid, I think, afterward, who was talking about how they had kind of held that in their back pocket? That, that was something, or maybe it was the, def, the the Eagles defense talking through it. I can't remember, but I know we talked about it on the show at the time. But that was something acknowledged somewhere by the people watching the film closely on, on either side of that game, that the Chiefs had shown the exact same look, but not where the, the motion man would return back to his side of the field. They held that in their back pocket until the very last game of the year because they wanted, they knew what their goals were for the season. It was to get all the way to there. You see this over a multi-year stretch when you're with a team like the Chiefs, when they've done it over multiple years. Patrick Mahomes probably could throw for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns like he did in his first breakout MVP season every year if they really wanted to do that. But they're so not you're trying telling to me set. that the, the Bills are going to hold Stephon Diggs back for the Super Bowl. I don't know that they're going to hold him back for the Super Bowl, but I do think when you think about them in a multi-year perspective, they are at this point where it's like they, they want to do what they need to do to get wins in the regular season and not much more. Whereas the Chargers are the type of offense right now, it's similar to the players that we were talking about. When you think about it from a life cycle, they're ascending, but they have not had the pieces together yet. If they get the opportunity to get everything to work and Rashawn Slater stays healthy on their offensive line this year and Keenan Allen's hitting and all of those things, they're going to try to throw for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns. They're going to try to have the best regular season they can possibly have and really test the limits of what they're capable of. 
because they haven't actually had that yet, right? And I, I just I feel like that's what we saw with the Eagles last year. That's what you see with the Bills in their first breakout season. That's what you saw with Patrick Mahomes in his first season where he threw for 5,050 and then hasn't gotten to those heights again, even though he's still been good enough to do that. You get on the ascension, the team really pushing what they're capable of in the regular season, whereas over multiple years of you know, the Bills evolution, you start to get a little bit more comfort with just taking what's there for you. And, and Anyway, that's sort of a an obscure point, but I do think the, the Keenan Allen point being one where I, I don't love Keenan Allen's age. I don't love his past injury profile and some of those things, but I, I the, the bet on him is, is cost. It's what I think he's capable of in terms of his own individual ability. And he does, I think still have that ceiling. And then it's the situation that I do think sets up so perfectly for the 2023 football season. And you do have to weigh all of the, those things across the, you know, the range to decide whether somebody is worth, targeting at a certain price for digs for Brown. We've talked about with his offense and even for lamb with some of the Mike McCarthy stuff. I don't love that with Amon Ross St. Brown. I do love it with the lions. I love what Dan Campbell wants to do with Garrett Wilson. I really think there's that potential for the Aaron Rodgers. you know, Tom Brady goes to Tampa Bay and lights it up season. He's supposedly really engaged in, in New York in a way he wasn't in green Bay in the off season program the last couple of years. He might be awful as well. Who knows? Like Roger Rogers might never be back to the, the player he was, but if he's at that level and the stuff he's already saying about Garrett Wilson, I mean, Garrett Wilson will just separate from the, from Alan Lazard and the rest of those guys. He's so clearly the top talent in that passing game that statistically there's, that's another guy who it would not surprise to see them really wanting to push what he could do. I mean, if they're, if they're crushing, I don't think they're going to stop crushing. Aaron Rodgers is going to go try and win another MVP with the Jets. And Garrett Wilson's probably going to have 1,600, 1,700, 1,800 yards. Like, why would they stop? You know, they're, 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 they would just keep going and going from a statistical standpoint. Um, does that, you know, is that the most likely scenario? No. But when I'm talking about these guys within the same tier, and Sean, we've talked about this late first to early second range all offseason as being a flat tier. That, that pushes me over the edge to wanting the Amon Ross and the Garrett Wilsons. And I don't think it's wrong. I have thought through this idea of, oh, yeah, these young guys are projecting a breakout over the more stable guys. There's, an, there's a reason we're, we're going after the young guys in these scenarios. And the thing that I keep thinking as I listen to you talk through it is that you really do always want to be a year early instead of a year late even if that makes you uncomfortable sometimes. I think we get in this mindset, or it's easy to get in this mindset, where you're thinking, especially in the first six or seven rounds, I can't make any mistakes. And you hear drafters talk about, you know, you can't win in the first round, but you can lose. It's like, well, I mean, that's true to an extent. But if we're thinking about Garrett Wilson versus Stephon Diggs, for me, there's not any question at all at which player has a better chance to be the overall wide receiver one. Right. And if you get a guy who goes for 1,700 yards and 17 touchdowns, you're going to win out of round one unless you blow the rest of your draft. One of the things that we also want to be thinking about is even early, you don't have to hit on everyone, but you do need to be stockpiling profiles that allow you to have a winning team at the end. And so we think about a year early as opposed to a year late, and that actually applies to both young players and older players. Because with the young players, you have to draft them before they show everything so that you still have room for it to grow. Now, with Garrett Wilson and, and Amon Ra, I don't know if those guys are even the best examples because they don't have a ton of room to outperform. But we're thinking, you know, who could be next year's 101? That still does matter. Certainly when you get into rounds five, six, seven, eight, you do have room to outperform and you've got to draft the guys before they do it if you want to get the huge outperformance. But when you think about a year early as opposed to a year late, that also is very directly relevant when you're thinking about guys who are age 28, age 29, age 30, age 31, because everybody after the fact is like, oh, well, you should have been aware of the fact that older players often fall off the cliff. And that's one of the things that you're looking at here is that aging in sports is not about a gradual decline in a huge number of cases. You go from being good enough to be a star to being more or less a bench type talent overnight when your athleticism drops a little bit because i mean we're talking about the very top athletes on the planet being mentally tough isn't just enough right you have to have the physical capabilities once you don't there's a cliff there so we think about that the other thing that kind of 
you know, jumps out to me here as we're thinking through this Diggs versus Allen element. And Allen is a couple of years older, and you do want to keep that in mind as well. But veteran wide receivers, even though we don't target them a ton, they also give you these rare, like very exploitable situations because with the veterans, you have their whole career that you can think through and evaluate and you get a sense of what their talent is and what their range of outcomes are. And you can make some of these other little adjustments for what, who their quarterback is, you know, that type of thing in ways that you can't necessarily for someone who you really do need their most recent season to give you a point in the right direction. Now we do know the most recent season is going to be, you know, very directly relevant when you're thinking about, you know, how are you going to use those stats to project the current year? But when we think about someone like a Keenan Allen, when he was healthy at the end of the year, the last five weeks of the season, he was the overall wide receiver too, behind just Justin Jefferson. So if you're willing to draft an older player, and one of the things that we want to keep in mind here too, is I think that some people have like a cutoff in their mind where they're like, okay, this age, now I'm no longer taking it, but that's not the way you should be thinking of it. No. You should be thinking about it as anybody who's old has a cliff possibility. And if you're fading that cliff possibility, what they did last year, is going to be the most relevant data point for you in terms of their current production. And then their overall career gives you a sense of who they are as a talent. Well, when you have that finish for Keenan Allen, and then he's going in the middle to late round three, as opposed to the one, two turn where he has gone in many cases throughout his career, or certainly would be if you adjust kind of the ADP context for 2023 ADP context, you know, he'd be a one, two turn guy. If you can get him at the three, four turn, that's something that you have to very strongly consider because we know he's a star. We know he had the super fast finish. He has the other contextual things that you were discussing in terms of the offense. That's a very easy play if you want to have some veterans in your lineup. Yeah, and we talked about the age cliff. I love the way you put that, but it's it is a thing where there's a few types of players. I, like Rob Gronkowski continued to produce until he stopped playing, and I think probably could have forever because he was that talented of a tight end. There are players who even if they start to lose some of the athleticism to your point, you can go from being star level to a bench player really quick, but that's not necessarily true for every player. I would argue there are a very select few of elite superstars that have enough talent, enough skill, whatever that they can, you know, age gracefully, if we will, right? Like Larry Fitzgerald still producing really late into his career. Steve Smith tore his Achilles. I was fading him. I was like, this guy's like 35, tore his Achilles. He came back and had like an 800-yard season after a torn Achilles because that guy was always just so good. I mean, and so there are – DeAndre Hopkins is a guy I'm still willing to take some this year. I'm not taking a ton. He's kind of old, but he's been really good throughout his career. Keenan Allen on that level for a guy with a low A dot, he is someone who's had multiple 2.5 yards per out run, you know, seasons. I was just referencing that stat. And so he is somebody that, as you said, you go back, you look at his history. Yeah, it was a lot of years ago, but at his peak, he was a top 10 receiver every year. He was a top three receiver, I think, at least once or a couple of times in PPR leagues. And now you think about the situation that he's in and, and this Chargers offense and where, you know, if, if Rashawn Slater helps book in their offensive line and Justin Herbert and Kellen Moore influences their passing game the way that we're thinking it could, this is the best offensive setup he's ever played in probably. He's not at his peak. But, but players will go through different offensive situations, and this could be the best one he's ever been in in terms of the passing game. He played a lot of good years with Phillip Rivers. I still think this probably could be depending. I mean, but if it hits the way that we're kind of hoping that it could hit in, in, in Los Angeles from a team perspective, and you want to be in on that if you know what this player is. And like you said, I think you described that incredibly well. His last season is the one that tells you where he's at right now. And last year, he was still really, really good. So, Sean, this whole idea extends as we talk through the tiers and we think through the position, extends into the middle rounds. And this is where we're all going to make or break our seasons at wide receiver because we we, we mentioned these top 14 receivers. Um, and there, I think everybody expects there to be sort of this big tier break after that point. And, and Keenan has for a lot of people fit into that wide receiver 15 range. Calvin Ridley has for a lot of people. He's another one though, that has taken a, spent a lot of time away from the game. And it is a lot of projection to assume that that hasn't affected his development. I mean, we all are rooting for him. We've talked this off season about the article he wrote over the players tribune, an incredible story. Uh, if you haven't read that, go back and read it. A lot of, you know, sort of some harrowing details about even, you know, having their their home broken into in his last um, season where he was actually playing some and how he had to deal with that during the football season. Some some tough stuff, certainly. Um, 
in his background and somebody that we're rooting for, but somebody who's been away from the game for the large part of, of two seasons. And it's similar to the Michael Thomas thing. We're like, it's not that we think that he can't play anymore, but there is a, a layer of, you know, how quickly we talked about the age curve can, you can fall off if you lose a step. Well, how about if you haven't really been able to hone your craft in NFL games for two years and continue to grow and to continue to learn the little subtle things that defensive backs are doing now and getting away with so they don't get called and all, you know, all of those types of things. It's tough and it's a tough way back, but he's another guy that gets thought of right after those top 14 receivers. And I've seen go into that top 14 in some high stakes stuff. And Ben as well, as it's become clear that he's having a great camp and is going to be their wide receiver one. A lot of those original concerns I had where, I mean, frankly, the, the results for guys who come back from suspensions have been very poor. And yet, I mean, we seem to be getting nothing but good news. So I think you can move him up. And I think that mentally I would then move him up into that range with, you know, I mean, Amari Cooper is a whole kind of separate thing, but Cooper and DJ Moore and Terry McLaurin, I mean, those types of guys, but that's not where he's going. I mean, he's going with multiple additional price levels of risk beyond that. And I mean, this isn't an offense where Christian Kirk was very good last year. Zay Jones emerged last year. And I mean, I know Evan Ingram can be a little bit controversial, but I mean, I wrote up Ingram in my apex draft breakdown. And, you know, one of the things talking about it there where, I mean, Ingram was a star as a rookie. And then he goes through all of that just desperately poor giants offensive situation through like the entire bulk of his career. And then from week 13 on last year, And again, I'm using the SIS numbers here, but 2.37 yards per route, 27% targets per route, 8.9 yards per target. I mean, this is a guy who, I mean, he's basically just a big receiver, right? I mean, came into the league with a 4-4-240 with 124-inch broad jump with an 89th percentile agility score. I mean, you're talking about the type of athlete that we normally go crazy over at the tight end position. And so when you're thinking about the Jaguars, and this is the reason I bring this up is I think we need to apply this to all teams. But when you look at the, the risk to price ratio for all four of those guys, I mean, I actually think that, I mean, I have Trevor Lawrence higher in my rankings than, than you do in yours. I think I've made the case that I actually think you can kind of make him a Justin Herbert, you know, arbitrage play that they're very similar in what you should expect. And it's not always the case, but there are certainly drafts out there where you get Lawrence like three rounds later. And that's a, that's a big difference in specific drafts. But when we're thinking about how you would play these receivers, I mean, each one of the four, I would argue because all four of them are likely going to be there. I mean, it actually looks like Christian Kirk from some of the preseason stuff could be in danger of massively underperforming his ADP, you know, but the, the cheapest guys and the guy for me and Evan Ingram who would give you the bigger positional advantage because it's so hard to fill tight end. I mean, those are some of the things like downstream of even than the receivers themselves that I think we have to be looking at here when we're tearing up these receivers and we're thinking about specific draft tactics. For sure. And that, I mean, so those guys are the start of, you know, Keenan and Ridley and those guys are the start of that next group. But Sean, what I – where I want to go as we start talking through that next group and, and, you know, making hay in the middle rounds is we get into the discussion of, I mean, I've, I struggled with this, with my rankings. Cause I, you know, I know a lot of people that use my rankings are using them in some more casual drafts. They're not as um, young upside uh, heavy. Right. And so we don't see, in some of the um, bigger sites in the ADP and the, where the guys will go, somebody like a Jackson Smith and Jigba might go multiple rounds lower than where he's going in, you know, a high stakes draft. And so I struggle with how high to put those guys up there. Cause then I get some people saying, well, would you really take this guy over this other guy that is going three or four rounds earlier? And the answer is usually, yes, I would, but I don't know if I would in your specific draft, if you can get him three rounds later, like what, you know, you could potentially get both of these players. So it is, it, it is difficult to rank in that range, but you mentioned the Amari Cooper uh, name and, and, and a couple of those veterans in that range, Terry McLaurin, DeAndre Hopkins going in that range. That is a very difficult receiver range. And then not long after that, we start to get guys that I think of more as targets. And I think if I was just ranking it outright, I probably would have JSN ahead of all of those names. I probably 
would even have the George Pickens and the Jahan Dotsons and the Quentin Johnstons up in that range. And the way that I have it in my rankings is that is one very large tier. And so it is difficult to communicate that. I, I understand the merit to some of the veterans. There are a few veterans in that range that I have, I know in my rankings, marked as targets. Um, even though I would, it, for me, it would be more integral in any build to get some of the youth upside. But there are some veterans in there that I think are really nice ways to play some of the past data and, and and sort of buying, you know, we again, don't pay for past production, but some of them come in at nice prices to what they actually are over a multi-year stretch or look like. Um, but is it, I mean, Sean, is it really as simple as the, the young receivers, the year two guys, the rookies that are going in round six, round seven, round eight, round nine in, in some of these home leagues, uh, you know, getting down into Zay Flowers and Traylon Burks and those guys. It's really as simple as the fact that like you should just get as many of of those youngsters on your roster as you possibly can. I think that it is, and um, again, we don't want to oversimplify it or make it sound silly, but it really is the case across different league types. And when we're looking at the main event, for example, you have to have guys who can win leagues against other very knowledgeable and motivated managers. And then, I mean, your ideal situation is to go and do what, you know, our, our bills guys have done and win the whole tournament, which you need to have players who dramatically outperform. But the other element here is that even though it seems like it might be less the case in home leagues, it's actually even more the case. And I jump, joke from time to time that, I mean, I'm definitely not the best fantasy player uh, in my extended family, that my sister wins you know, her home leagues every year and takes basically the things that we do and then adjusts them for home leagues <laughs> and wins. And, and she you know, likes to draft the elite QBs. And every time I get out of a draft and tell her who I've selected, you know, she just shakes her head. She doesn't know why like drafting Sam Howell needs to be a focal point of any given draft plan. But one of the things <laughs> that you're looking at there is that you can take guys in the first five or six rounds who are very dynamic and give you an elite starting lineup and give you both a high floor and a high ceiling. And then you can come back and select these unproven receivers to seed your lineup with just so much upside because I mean, there are two basic reasons that you get this in home leagues. One is that it's difficult to represent all of the upside that those players have in projections. So even though um, the sites that you tend to play home leagues on now, in most cases have very, very talented experts who are putting together the projections that are used as the basis for the default rankings. These receivers that we're talking about with all the upside are still going to fall down those rankings a little bit. And then in many cases, they are going to also be faded just slightly by the leagues themselves because many of the managers in those leagues are not as familiar with them. And if you're playing, you know, one or two leagues, you're not saying, well, <laughs> You know, what's the highest upside way to play this league and this league and this league and this league? You're saying, I'm going to be with these guys for a year. I want to draft kind of a middle of the road guy that I am familiar with and that I'm comfortable with the risk profile. And so the younger players will slide down just a little bit. And one of the guys that I'm thinking of here, or I guess maybe two names that I think are, are pretty relevant to mention would be Drake London is somebody that I've been pretty nervous about taking at his high stakes ADP. But it's a massive no-brainer in his home league ADP. And then Brandon Ayuk is an interesting guy where we got a lot of pushback when we selected JSN ahead of Ayuk in last week's ship chasing draft. And Ayuk did go the very next pick. But Ayuk has like a seventh round ADP in home leagues. And that's you know going to be across a variety of, of platforms. If you get Brandon Ayuk in the seventh round, not only does he have to be a clear target there, and also, he's not actually that young. This is an established kind of guy. But he's someone that you have to then almost build the entire rest of your strategy around because you know you're getting a 
we, we passed on him in round five. And so it'd be hard to say, oh, he's like a great value in round five. But part of that is just because of other players we could get. I mean, in my rankings, he's going to be like a round four guy. <laughs> so you, you then move him down to round seven and you think about how can I fill the rest of my roster in around that? Because I'm being given guys like Drake London and Brandon Ayuk and JSN and George Pickens, Jahan Dotson. I mean, Pickens and Dotson are not as discounted, but they give you other names in that range in case you miss. And that's something that you want to think about is like, who's my backup plan? If this guy that I've been told is going to definitely win my league for me, you know, if he doesn't get hurt, I mean, all of these things, the guys can get hurt, but when you also have those backup plans who have such great floor ceiling situations, that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you play it earlier. But because you can stack in so much youth, and in most of these cases, if you're in a 2-2-1 format, so two running backs, two wide receivers, and then one flex, you also have the flexibility to take some risks because the guys who miss simply don't factor in. And you have so much on the waiver wire as well. So those are going to be some of the things that we're thinking as we think across platforms and across the different league types. The high upside players, crucial in high stakes and main events, but also really the foundation for winning your home league. Yeah, that was, I mean, very well put. And I, as you were talking through that, I was thinking about... Um, I mean, you mentioned a lot of other players, but I was thinking about the Ravens as a really great example of this as well, because we have uh, this dichotomy between Odell Beckham and the young receivers, where Odell Beckham is a great example of what we were talking about a little earlier about you know paying for past production and some of those things, and also time away from the game and all those things. So there are people who are playing and think Odell Beckham has – meaningfully higher ceiling than Zay Jones and Rashad Bateman this year, because we have seen Odo Beckham be so exceptional, but you have to go back to really his rookie season was his best season. If you look at something like a yards per out run type number, that was in 2014, right? That was a decade ago. And then he had a couple other really strong seasons the next three, four years, but none as quite as good as his rookie season on a per route basis, still strong. And then since 2019 and 2018 was his last yards per out run over two, 2019, uh, 2020 were okay, but in the 1.8 yards per out run range. 2021, he ran 400 routes, was at 1.3. And he was coming back from, you know, I think his first ACL tear, right? And it was a little bit of a um, not fully healthy situation for him that year. But then he also tears his ACL at the end of that year and misses all of 2022. So we haven't seen Odell Beckham Jr. play at a really high level, you know, really high level, maybe since 2018, depending on how you want to quantify that certainly at a, at a high level that was anything sort of mirroring what his peak was since 2020. And that's still a multiple years removed. And so what is his actual ceiling going into 2023 is the big question. And again, there are people that look at him as, oh, I mean, he's fully healthy again now and he's back to being the player that he was a long, long time ago. And I, I do think there's merit to saying that Otto Beckham at his peak was a really good player and potentially has the, you know, the, the ability to, to tap back into that sum in 2022. But I don't understand just why, what we saw from him in 2014 to 2018, why that means we should expect his ceiling to be really, really strong in 2023 relative to the potential of players. We have not seen a full season ceiling from in Zay flowers. who we haven't seen play at the NFL level at all, or Rashad Bateman, who we saw, have a rough rookie season on a per route basis, a better second season last year, but not really run a whole lot of routes. And we really haven't seen him put it all together at all at the NFL level. And he's been banged up this preseason. There's a lot of reasons to be concerned about him as well. But for me, the point is when we're talking about these ceiling scenarios and these positive outcomes, I look at this and I say, well, Flowers and Bateman, for them, if I were to fast forward three or four years into the future and look back, if they are hits – in their careers, 2023 could look like what? And it could look like a really strong season uh, for both of them from a profile perspective that I think makes sense. Same thing with Odell Beckham. If I go forward three or four years and I look back, I'm probably saying in three or four years, I don't really think he's probably playing a lot of football anymore at that point. And if he were to have one of those types of years, like I, I mentioned the Steve Smith you know, year where he's through a throwback 800 yard season, it wasn't even a thousand yard season. Uh, if I remember that correctly, but it was it was so impressive, honestly. Um, 
Yeah, 799 yards at age 37 after the Achilles year. I mean, just an incredible year to, to be able to do that in 14 games. If Odo Beckham were to have a season like that this year, if I'm three years in the future and looking back, I would still think of that as a really impressive way for him to have come back after this time away from the game at the age that he's at now uh, to have posted that in the 2023 season. Again, I'm looking at this well in the future. He's going to turn 31 this season. If he has a 1,500-yard season, I think I'm looking back on that as one of the greatest outlier seasons that we've ever seen, that he was able to come all the way back and hit that peak again, so many years removed from that type of peak. And so, I mean, look, the market is taking Zay Flowers and, and Rashad Bateman ahead of Beckham. All this stuff is cost uh, dependent. And and it, I'm not trying to like make a case that everybody's saying Beckham is better than those players or has more ceiling than those players. The market is actually telling us probably quite the opposite. But I do think that was an interesting passing game where it's not clear who the bet should be because all of those guys are in the relatively the same range. And yet I, I don't think it should be so confusing, right? And again, there you're thinking through this combination of upside and price and what that means in terms of roster construction. Now you can't go out there and miss on all of your picks. We don't want to give the impression that you can but having a little bit of risk to get the upside is necessary. And, and this is going to be a little bit of a, I don't know if misleading is the right terminology for it, but when we're thinking about risk, one of the risks is simply that the guy doesn't have a massive ceiling in his range of outcomes. Amari Cooper has never had a 1200 yard season. And so when you're looking at him in that range, especially now that you have Elijah Moore there, Cedric Tillman has even supposedly had a very nice camp. Overall, the passing game supposedly looks very poor. So we don't want to look at a guy who was one of the best outperformers last season and then move him up because that's, I mean, you don't get last year's win rate in the same way that you also don't get last year's production. To take the guys who were number one and number two overall and to say, okay, they had good rookie seasons you know, that's probably not going to surprise people and in some ways isn't that relevant. But I do think it's an interesting note that both Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase had rookie seasons that crush every single season that Amari Cooper has had in his career. And so if we think in terms of Jackson Smith and Jigba, if you think he even is a poor man's version of those guys, I mean, that's something that you want to be thinking of in terms of like where could he go and how much can he outperform the players who are more or less giving you this narrow range with downside, which is what a player like a Cooper, a player like a Mike Williams. I think that probably a player like a Terry McLaurin, even though I like McLaurin a lot better, but with McLaurin, you've got, you know, some mild profile concerns. And then at his price, he's the guy of the two players who is at risk. If the offense is merely mediocre. And that's one of the things that you want to work through. What happens if the offense is great? Then I think Terry McLaurin can be good and mildly outperforms ADP. But again, you're talking about mildly outperforms ADP. If the offense is mediocre, then he probably comes through close to where he's being drafted, but with some downside risk of Jahan Dotson simply being better. If the offense is bad, then he's going to be a hole in your lineup. You're going to have a guy you drafted in the wide receiver 25 range who isn't playable. Then you think about that from the teammate perspective, and it's a very different dynamic for Dotson, who, you know, at the wide receiver 40 range, even if the offense is bad, if he's the guy who is the one, can still be okay for you. But at the mediocre and at the excellent levels, then he is closing in on being a league winner. And so we have to kind of make those determinations throughout the draft. We look about how's the, the best way to play an individual team as well. And so I think this idea of pricing the guys and thinking through where your upside is, it just becomes so crucial because again, if you're going to get that six receivers out of the top 15, not only is it going to be more difficult than it was previously, but it's going to take thoughtfulness and actual player selection in 2023. You know, I mentioned the other day, 
the 2013 season. So, you know, we go back a decade. We think about the breakouts for Alshon Jeffrey and Josh Gordon. Again, those are player profiles that going into those seasons for those guys you knew were undervalued. Doesn't mean they were necessarily going to hit, but the profile itself was undervalued. Drafters have caught up to some of that, but you can still get those small edges throughout your draft by making sure you have that type of player and that type of profile. And we say profile a lot. You can go even to the next step and say like, this is the guy within this profile that I think I want to have on my team. And especially if you're doing one or two drafts, make sure you go out and get those guys. You want to be rooting for your favorites as the season goes along. Yeah. We always love to talk about Sean, the small miss, big hit type players. When you're talking through McLaurin and Dotson, like, not just is Dotson going cheaper. That's not the whole part of it. That is part of it. The market loves to favor the veterans, but it's also that we know what McLaurin's ceiling probably is. It's good. It's not great. He's never been the, a top five type receiver uh, in terms of fantasy scoring, at least. Uh, Dotson theoretically could be that, could have that type of ceiling. And, and again, you know, you, you you mentioned that what the profiles are and, all we can do is keep talking about these examples from the past. You mentioned Alshon Jeffrey and, and Josh Gordon and how they hit and where they hit and, and what level they hit at in their breakout seasons. And there's so many examples of it. I mean, for some reason in my head, and this isn't really fair because Julio Jones was an incredible prospect, but I go back to thinking about how people did not think Julio Jones could beat out Roddy White. And I mean, just look at what Julio Jones became as an NFL player. And you think back to that and it seems ridiculous. But part of the reason we're going this far back in history is – you need that, you know, the, that much of the career to be able to really look back and reflect and go, man, it is kind of weird that like Roddy White was a really good receiver for the record. Loved Roddy White. But like people thought Julio Jones didn't have the ceiling as Roddy White was aging to become the number one over Roddy White. And that just happens naturally when the player is really good. The younger guy just just sort of does become the number one. That could happen uh, in Washington. Uh, you know, not that McLaurin's getting older or anything. It could happen in a lot of places. The other name that you mentioned, Sean, and I just, as we get ready to wrap up here, one thing that I want to say is we keep talking about these ceilings and these scenarios and really having the upside. It's hard to quantify, but the way that you quantified it with Amari Cooper not having a 1,200-yard season was great. I'll also note last year, most fantasy points of his career in a season, PPR points, he had 248. I used to say, I know last offseason, this guy's never had a 250-point fantasy season. He basically hit that last offseason, and I think that was a ceiling outcome for him. Justin Jefferson had 365 last year. So for the listeners that are trying to wrap their head around that, that don't spend a lot of time looking at the actual fantasy results, that's what we're talking about. Mark, 250 is still usually good for a low-end wide receiver one season. Mark Cooper was the wide receiver 10. But there's a difference between a ceiling that gets you to the low-end wide receiver one. And I think there's a lot of analysts that talk about, hey, this guy was the wide receiver eight last year. This guy was the wide receiver six last year or he was in some different season. And a lot of times it's a bit misleading because that really is sort of that player's ceiling. And there's a lot of players that got hurt. And whether you're talking about it from total points or points per game is an important element and all of those things. Amari Cooper's 248 point season last year was very good. He was a wide receiver 10. It was not league winning. It is not the ceiling that we're looking for with these picks. And it was a career high for him. So in terms of what, you know, our concern is about him, I've had people tell me, well, take last year's numbers, and now that he's got a better quarterback, he's got to score more than that. And I'm like, you you got to go look at his whole career because you can't just start with last year as the anchor when it was a career number for him. That's that. I mean, it's possible that Amari Cooper goes out and has an even bigger year this year. I'm not saying that's not possible. But that's the mistake I think some people fall into. When I said Justin Jefferson had 365 last year as the wide receiver one, Cooper Cup had 437 the year prior We had five guys that year and 300 plus six guys last year at 300 plus. If a guy's ceiling is 250 PPR points, it's probably a pretty good benchmark for the kinds of guys that we're saying don't have enough ceiling to go lead the position. Right. And Diggs had an incredible year last year. He's a guy we talked about a little bit at the top of the show. He had 316 points. AJ Brown had 303. Go back to 2020 Diggs really strong season, 328 points. Those are really high-end totals, and and Diggs did really well to get up over 300 twice in the last three years in this offense. I think both you and I kind of feel like 300 will be tough for him to hit this year, certainly for him to then take that next step and compete with the guys that are hitting 350 and above as the legit number one. So go back to 2020, Devontae Adams was the number one at 360 PPR points. That's what it takes. 
It takes that next step, not just 250 and, and, and 300 PPR points you'll take for any receiver, frankly, but not just 300 even is sort of the point I'm trying to make. You, you know, we, we want these guys that can have the breakout seasons where they can score at those levels. And, and to talk about 350 points, you, again, it's better to talk about in points per game. You're talking about 20 plus PPR points per game, 21, 22 plus PPR points per game. That's when you get to the really special wide receiver seasons. Not every wide receiver has that, that has that potential, frankly. And when we think about it too, from this perspective of, well, what can the understudy potentially do and why would he be the person to target when you're thinking about how do you manage risk a little bit? Cause I think that a lot of times what we're discussing sounds risky. And yet I, I want to emphasize all of these things that you can do to mitigate that risk throughout the draft, like taking the second player on a team. If you also believe in the talent, you were mentioning 300 points, Juju Smith Schuster, who unfortunately now is just a very, very different player and I mean, you almost would need to give him a different name from a fantasy perspective to understand how that profile has shifted. But he was one of the youngest players to come into the NFL. He had a fantastic rookie season. He was playing behind or with Antonio Brown and put up 298 points in his second year. When you're looking at the talent, when you're looking at how someone could beat expectations, even and sometimes especially with that guy ahead of him, certainly if you make the jump and you flip spots, you're going to be able to do it or at least do it better relative to price, but you don't even always have to because that wasn't the season that Antonio Brown collapsed. I and mean, that was much later, right? So again, look for the profile who could get you up near that 300 points that Ben just gave you, I think is a really interesting and dynamic and certainly fantasy winning benchmark. Definitely. And Sean, you know, we said we're going to talk through the wide receiver tiers and targets. We kind of did. <laughs> we got to the middle rounds. We do think, you know, that wide receiver window is so key to be hitting the wide receivers inside of that. We talked through the, the back end of the Zay Flowers or Traylon Burks profiles towards the back of it. There's a couple of those transition guys. You know, I've been taking a I, I just went through my underdog exposures as i approach 100 completed drafts i just got started with the underdog drafts in in june ish of this year and uh realized that i have a lot more romeo dobbs than i realized but he's a guy that's a transition guy that you know you, you sometimes can get after every other window wide receiver is gone and so that, that's apparently what i've been doing in more drafts that i realized i've been doing he's my second most drafted receiver but he is somebody that in my rankings i have ranked just inside the wide receiver window, even though he goes after receivers that I have drafted or ranked outside of the wide receiver window. So that, that leads to that type of exposure. I do think, you know, he's like a transition guy. There's a few transition guys in that range. The real sort of end where it starts to slam shut for me, Sean, is when I see Quentin Johnston go off and then Rashad Bateman has fallen. Traylon Burks has fallen with their injuries when I see Bateman and when I see Burks go off. That's those are the ones this year where it's like that's what what it felt like when Garrett Wilson would go off last year and you're like you don't have any other any other real strong profiles like those guys left at that point. There are some later round ones. You've had some that you've talked to uh, to me about. You mentioned uh, before the show a later round rookie who had uh, an incredible preseason game, Rasheed Rice, as a, you know a guy that probably should be moving a little bit up. But yeah, any any other thoughts on the end of the wide receiver window and then the later rounds outside the window, how to play that stuff? Well, I think you have the window exactly right. Romeo Dobbs is about wide receiver 50, and I think you can make the case that it's a hard slam shut after him. And I'm not surprised you have that exposure so high. He's one of my highest drafted players. I hope that works out. The compelling part is that He's looked very good in the two preseason games. We know not to overstate those, but it's always the case when you're out on a field competing, better to look good than look bad. So we'll take that as a positive. It does slam shut after that. And I think that, again, tactically, what we want to be thinking here is if you're in an underdog draft, if you are in an FFPC draft, main event, what have you, I think in either of those situations, you really want to have six receivers by the time that window 
closes. Now, there are a few things I think you can do, especially in a 2-2-2 format that would be creative and that would create a dynamic where you maybe don't have to have that. But unless you have a very well thought out and intentional plan to get around it in a league, I think it's just fairly straightforward to think in terms of six within that 50 is going to position you nicely to do the other things that you need. If you are in a 2-2-1, two, two, so two running backs, two wide receivers, one flex, then in those types of formats, and especially if they have shallower benches and a lot of options each week on the waiver wire, then I think you can get away with just having the five, but you're going to really want to target the back end of it, I think, because you should get some great values there. So when we think about the the window and what that means in terms of building your team out, that's those are kind of the numbers that I'm looking at. But there are some some names late that are fun. I mean, certainly we're hoping that Justin Ross continues to build on you know what he's been doing. Marvin Mims hasn't had much of a chance to do a lot with the injury that he's had, but still, I mean, in many ways, because of that, I think you're going to be able to get him at prices that you know maybe a month from now everybody's like you know what, what were we doing how did we let him get yeah, because so he, not only has he been hurt obviously his main competition has been hurt as well tim patrick gets hurt kj hamler gets hurt again and gets released as a result and so things have really opened up for him yeah you have jalen hyatt who has been a camp sensation put up some yards and points in the second preseason game you know maybe didn't do it as early in that game as you might like if you're trying to draft him and, and like actually start him right away but he's somebody uh, blair andrews again lots of great research on him he seemed very undervalued in the reality draft and so if you're looking at where he went in the draft and that part concerns you i would say don't let it he should have been drafted much earlier if you like the camp reports you know, definitely feel free to look at him as someone who was drafted in the same range as Marvin Mims and Jonathan Mingo. I very clearly should have gone there. Uh, any other names that you're seeing here that you like? I know Curtis Samuel is a name where, again, you probably don't want to count on him, but depending on what your needs are late, he fits some of the things that we're looking for. Yeah, definitely have taken a decent amount of him. I think those are that's a good rundown, honestly. And, and still trying to target the young profiles uh, makes a lot of sense. We, we, just talked through that we both are drafting a lot of Dobbs, but I think Jaden Reed is, is playing enough early and that Packers receiving core. I think we've talked about it on the show, but I, I know back when I did my projections, seeing that every single receiver they had on their roster, they had like 12 at the time were 2022 or 2023 rookies. So either rookies or second year players, uh, they're going to start a bunch of young guys and they're going to run them out there. It looks like uh, Luke Musgrave is going to be their full-time tight end as well. And so Reed does look like he's pretty clearly locked into their three receiver sets with Dobbs and Christian Watson and has some potential to, to be a hit if he's just immediately really good. Um, but no, I think you hit on on the majority of them. For me, really, the, the main targets in those rounds are, are Rice and Mims. So we have some other rookies from the offenses who have rookie quarterbacks the preseason has not been especially encouraging for those guys. We did a full show, Ben, on the offenses that are going to be helmed by rookies. Anybody who wants to get a feel for our take on that, make sure you check out that show. Obviously, time has passed, and there are going to be some details that have shifted. But, you know, unless I'm misremembering, the things that we discussed there should still be relevant for drafters. And, yeah, this has been a great exercise. Ben has an excellent article up from just the last – couple of days looking at his wide receiver tiers over at stealing signals if you want to get a little more detail on that make sure you subscribe there you can subscribe to stealing signals you can subscribe to stealing lines i mentioned at the beginning you're probably going to want to subscribe to stealing signals gold that's a fun streaming platform that ben has set up where he can answer your questions you know so much fun getting to chat with him and that that'll do it for today's episode of stealing bananas on wide receiver tactics for the 2023 draft season. I am Sean Siegel. With me is Ben Gretsch. You can follow at Yards Per Gretsch. We'd love to have you guys over at Rotoviz as well. The coupon there is RV Radio 2023 at checkout for a 10% discount on your one-year subscription. Ben, I did want to mention we've gotten lots of great reviews on Stealing Bananas for the contest that I am doing where the best review, the most creative review, or since we've gotten so many good ones, obviously there'll be a, a drawing from all of these fantastic reviews. The winner of that 
will draft a fantasy pros team with me where your upside there is to win a million dollars for us to split. So half a million, leave a rating and review. That'll come up fairly soon, Ben, because <laughs> draft season, as you mentioned, at the top doesn't have that many more days in it. So, and, and just anybody who's leaving those just all the way along, we appreciate those so much. They help us with the algorithm. You guys are the best. We'll talk to you soon.